I'm going to just pray and then we're going to have a seat because I've got a text, but it's a little bit later on in, in the, the message. So I'm going to forgive me. I know it's breaking protocol. I could read it, but it would waste time here at the beginning. It's a little bit lengthy. So I'm going to let you sit through that. So I'm trying to be trying to be nice to you. So let's just pray and ask God to have his way. Father, speak to us today. Help me get across what's on my heart in a powerful way. Let us feel the presence of your spirit throughout this message. God, speak to us, change us, rearrange us, work us. God, do what you want to do today in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. And you can be seated. So I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes there's, there's moments or times, seasons in life when you think you have things going pretty good, but then God places you on the potter's wheel and begins to work things out. And it's not always a pleasant experience. And that's kind of where I've been for the past couple of months or so. And today, I'm just going to let you in on the voices or the, the voice in my head. And, and let, so I'm preaching to myself this morning. You guys are just along for the ride. So, so buckle up because it's, it's going to be a fun experience. But I'm going to use the story of Joseph again. I've been going over the story of Joseph now for the past probably three or four months and, and just picking out different truths about Joseph. Brother Dustin tagged in. He, he, he dealt with Joseph when he preached last time. And as he was preaching, I was sitting over there and something jumped out at me in the scripture that I, I hadn't seen before. And, and I want to talk to you this morning on this subject, and, and I'm tagging into Pastor Jared's series, More Than Conquerors. If you haven't listened to those first three messages, go back and check those out. But I'm tagging in, and I want to talk to you on this subject, More Than a Dream, More Than a Dream. And as always, I don't want to make the mistake of assuming that everyone in here knows the, the story of Joseph, so I'm going to do a real quick Bible study just to make sure that we're all on the same page. If you've heard it before, great. If you haven't, I'm going to catch you up with us, but our story begins with a Hebrew boy named Joseph, and he's only 17 years old at the beginning of this story, and he's the youngest. He's the favored son of his father, whose name is Jacob, and Jacob does have 10 other sons who are Joseph's half-brothers, and they're, they're all older, but Joseph is the favorite son of Jacob because he's the only son he's had so far to the beloved and beautiful wife, Rachel, and Joseph is a good kid but he's got a problem. He's a snitch. He has this habit of tattling on his older brothers and his brothers hate him because of it. And I'm just going to take a quick time out right here and just let you know this truth. No one likes a gossip. That's, that's just free. No one likes a gossip. I'm just saying. And we all know that eventually snitches get stitches. So this story is not shaping up too good for Joseph. It starts off like this. And then one day Joseph has these strange dreams and he tells his family about the dreams and they get even madder at him because symbolically these dreams seem to place Joseph at the head of the family. And so their anger just begins to build until one day his brothers come up with a plan to kill him. So they beat him, they throw him in this pit, they leave him for dead. But one of his brothers named Judah decides killing him, that would just be wrong. Let's just sell him to some slave traders instead. The kind, the very, very kind of him there. Then we can dip his, his clothes in animal's blood and we can give it to our father and his, the, the father will think that, our, that his son is, is dead and that'll be the end of the story. And so that's what they do. They sell them to some Midianite slave traders who trade him in Egypt to this man named Potiphar who just happens to be one of the rulers of Egypt that serves under Pharaoh who is the most powerful man on the planet at the time. Eventually, Joseph, over the process of time, becomes overseer of Potiphar's house until he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of assaulting her, and Potiphar sides with his wife, and now Joseph is thrown in prison, but over time in the prison, Joseph becomes overseer of the prison as well. While there, he meets these two guys. He interprets their dreams. The interpretations come true. Two years later, the ruler of Egypt has a dream or a couple of dreams that no one can interpret. The prisoner, the ex-prisoner tells Pharaoh about Joseph and he calls Joseph out and Joseph interprets his dreams as well. And then I want to pick up in the scripture here and this is the text that I want to, that I want to bring to you. I want to show you what happens next. Joseph interprets the dreams and then Joseph says this in Genesis 41 and 33. Therefore... 
Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise the famine will destroy the land. And Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet looks to his advisors and says, can we find a man such as this, a man in whom the spirit of God dwells? And it just leapt out at, to me, at me that the interpretation of the dream isn't what really got Pharaoh's attention. We, we label Joseph the dreamer. That, that's what we call him. But when you look in scripture, the, the, the Bible doesn't reference him. God never referenced him as a dreamer. When you look at the text, the only person who ever called him a dreamer was the same brothers who wanted to kill him. And they meant it as an insult. You're just a dreamer. You, you, you just have these, these dreams. And if you really want to break it down, you look at Joseph, Joseph's life. And there's five instances throughout Scripture where there was something to do with a dream. And we define this man by this, these five moments in his life. We completely define him by those moments. Joseph, the dreamer. But I'm going to tell you this morning, that's a mistake on our part. Because Joseph was so much more than a dreamer. Joseph was a man of action. He saw the opportunity here and he interprets the dream and then immediately says, this is what we need to do. And he begins to devise a plan. And Pharaoh says, how can there be such a man as this? A man in whom the spirit of God dwells. What do they say? Game recognizes game. Pharaoh understood there's more to this guy than meets the eye because he's not just some empty dreamer somewhere. He's not just a guy who can interpret dreams. There's something deeper to him. And so I want to pull some truths out of this story and help us this morning. I believe that God wants to revive some dreams in this house this morning. Truth number one, there's a difference between a dream and a vision. There's a difference between a dream and a vision. Every meaningful dream, every meaningful dream has some God purpose in it. Therefore, a dream is nothing more than a seed that is planted in our mind, a supernatural seed that God gives us. It's a promise from God. A dream is a state of desire or a deep yearning inside. But although a dream can be positive, I want to tell you that a dream is dangerous. A dream is dangerous because a dream allows for creativity without a commitment toward completion. A dream will allow for inspiration but require no action. A dream is dangerous because although it gives hope for a better future, it has no transformative or, or creative power within itself. It, it does not have the ability to rearrange or work out your future. In other words, a dream does not come true just because you had it. And I'm going to tell you this, a dream doesn't even come to pass just because God sent it. At some point, the dream has to become a vision because a vision is different. A vision has purpose to it. A vision requires strategic innovation and some intentionality in your life. A vision demands commitment. That's why the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision is important because without a clear objective to build toward in my life, without something that demands my achievement and my action, the Bible says the people perish. One version of that says, without a vision, the people cast off restraint. It, it means that without a unifying vision, over time, people just don't take things that serious anymore. Over time, naturally, people become unintentional about the kingdom of God. Over time, they become easily distracted. Over time, they begin to seek natural appeasements and allurements and achievements, and they forget to prioritize God and his kingdom, and it just happens naturally without a vision. And I felt God impress me over the past few weeks. I have things that I want to get done. I have works that I would like to accomplish. I have missions that I would like to get done, but I have too many dreamers. And what I've given you, Jonathan, what I'm calling you toward, it's more than a dream. It's more than a dream. A man had a recurring dream that he became a millionaire. And 
After hearing it or having this dream for several weeks in a row and then waking up each morning to find that nothing had changed, he, he grew very discouraged. He started getting kind of upset and depressed and he was eating lunch with a friend one day and he was venting to his friend about how upset he was that he kept having this dream and it was not coming true. And he talked about how surely this dream has to mean something because I'm having it over and over again. And this friend looked at him and said, what have you started doing to improve your chances of becoming a millionaire? And the young man said, well, nothing. It's just supposed to happen. It's, it, it's a dream that I've been having. And his friend just kind of laughed at him and said, then I can't help you because this is how dreams work. If you don't work it while you're awake, the dream will not work itself. It will never come to pass. Which brings me to point number two, work it while you're awake. Work it while you're awake. And please hear me, without action, every promise remains a dream. Every promise remains a dream. Most dreams, and this is alarming to me, most dreams that lie dead do so not because they were not believed, but because they were not worked. And I'm going to tell you this morning that the dream is a hope, but it is not a rope. You know that this idea that we have at times, if I can just hold on long enough, if I can just survive this long enough, if I can just hold on and get through this, then good things are going to happen. But I'm going to tell you the dream is a hope, but it's not a rope that we hold on to. Too often God gives dreams. He places callings in our life. He, he tries to instill divine purpose within us. And our response is to hold on to the dream, hoping that one day God will do what he said. One day, hopefully, God will perform the promise. But the dream is a hope. It's not a rope. It's a, it, it, hope is not a strategy that I can just live by. Never for a moment believe that the dream has some innate power within it. The dream is sent to direct you, but it can never define you. The dream is sent to inspire you, but it will never anoint you. The dream is sent to challenge you, but it can never complete you. As with anything in life, you will be defined, anointed, and completed only by the effort that you give and the work you're willing to put in. The plans that you make and keep, there has to be a vision. Let me try it like this. Noah, it's raining. The earth is opened and the waters are coming up. What about all this two by two stuff that you talked about? The animals that you were going to save. I thought you were going to be saved. Now the flood is here and you're sitting here. What are you doing, Noah? Well, I'm holding on hope that God's going to show up. God said he would save me. And I know it looks bleak right now, and I know we're all getting wet, and no one believed me, but now here it is. And I just believe at any moment, rescue and salvation's coming. Boy, you're about to drown. You had the opportunity, and you didn't do the work. I'm going to tell you, I, I, could, I, could, I don't have time. I could go through character after character in Scripture that God comes in and speaks, and if they don't act, nothing happens. The dream will never come to fulfillment. Dreams only come to fulfillment when we act on those dreams. The key to a dream is this. Men and women of the faith were anointed and they were successful only because they did more than dream. They worked the dream. So this leads me to point number three. And I don't normally do this. I don't normally tell you what I think is the meat of the message, but I'm going to tell you, I've preached all of this to get here because this is what God has really been dealing with me about. We need a renewal of godly works. We need a renewal of godly works. I heard about a boss one time who was talking to his employee about this employee's inability to finish projects on time. The employee replied, well, sir, I do things without making mistakes. I'm a professional. And the boss looked at him kind of funny and he replied, professional? Hmm. You do put pro in procrastination. But I need you to be a little bit less professional and make something happen around here. And sometimes I wonder if God doesn't look at me the same way. Jonathan, when it comes to a Christian, 
you're a professional. You look the part, you talk the part, sometimes you even think the part, but I need you to make some things happen around here. And I think part of the problem is that Christianity has created this culture that minimizes action and inflates status. You know, I'm, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm full of the Holy Ghost, bless God. I'm a child of the King. He's my father and he wants to give me good things. He loves giving good things to his people. I'm, I'm chosen, I'm redeemed. And all of those things are true and I'm not taking anything from those things. But notice all of those things revolve around status. All statements of status of who I am. And while every one of them are true, if we're not careful, this is what status does. Status leads to entitlement. And we start believing the hype of who we are and we forget the responsibility of who we are. We forget the work that we're called to do. And, and I'm just going to tell you, we are called to work. We're called to work. And I know that sounds strange because in the religious world we live in today, it's almost a heresy to talk about that because a major teaching of current Christianity is this idea that we're not saved by works. And we're not. I'll clarify, we're not saved by works. But it's almost like we preach that so hard and we believe that so much that now works has become a negative thing in Christian circles. It's created this culture where I can just relax on my status as a child of the king but do minimum to add value to the kingdom. I can desire the benefits of the kingdom without ever feeling a need to benefit the same kingdom that I'm benefiting from. And unfortunately, this idea has produced Christians that appear holy, but they're not whole. Christians who have freedom from sin, but they're not living free. Christians who are holy, yet they're not happy, who have a piousness about them, but are not at peace, who, yes, feel compassion, but they're not changing anything, and they're not conquering anything. And we're called to be more than conquerors. And this idea, I'm going to tell you, it's far. It's far from the Christianity that God came and robed himself in flesh to establish. The necessity of works may be strange to contemporary theology, but it was not odd to the early church. It was a fundamental and foundational doctrine. That is why James, the brother of Jesus and significant leader of the early church, some say the leader of the early church, made this statement in James 2 and 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless that faith produces good deeds or the, the King James says faith without works is dead. It's, it's useless. You can't just build on faith, faith without works. Paul, another key leader of the New Testament, addressed this to the church at Philippi when he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that verse is confusing. It confuses a lot of people because Again, we can't earn salvation. And so I want to read this in the New Living Translation, and then I'm going to try to break it down in a way that the early readers really would have understood what Paul was talking about. In Philippians 2 and 12, he says this, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence, and fear for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. This ties directly to Philippians 1 and 6 when he told them earlier, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. And I don't have time to do those scriptures justice this morning. There's so much power just in those three verses right there. But I do want to show you the essence of the message that Paul was giving the church at Philippi. The Greek word for work out is ketergasme. It means to work until the task is accomplished. It means to take a project and bring it to completion. Or, or watch this. It means to bring something to its full potential. In essence, what Paul was saying is you receive the Holy Ghost church. Cool. 
cool. You were saved. That's great. I applaud you. But you're not finished. Now you need to let the, the, the work, the Holy Ghost the, that you now have on the inside of you, you need to let that begin to work in your life and reach your full potential. The moment you were saved, that wasn't your full potential. That, that's just the beginning of what God wants to do. Paul said, you've got to understand from that moment forward to the day that Jesus Christ comes back for his church. He's constantly working to develop and to pull and to create and to do something with your life. You can't just rest on the laurels of that moment that you had when you were saved. No, he said, you've got to move beyond that moment. And become something more in the kingdom. You weren't saved just to put your name on some church roll. You weren't saved just to serve on Sunday and Dream Team. You are awesome. Thank you for everything that you do. I forgot to tell you that earlier, but we could not function without you. But I'm going to tell you, you weren't saved just to serve on Sunday. God, your God wants to do something great in your everyday life. He wants to bring you to your full potential. And I am the teaching pastor, in case you didn't know, so I'm going to teach this for just a moment. It's a deeper concept that I want to try to make it simple, but there's a huge difference between justification and sanctification. And you've probably heard those terms before and may or may not know what they really mean. And there's a trap the enemy wants us to fall into concerning salvation. He, he wants us to feel so complete at justification that we stop right there. Because if we stop at justification, again, we're holy, but we're not, we're not whole and we're not happy. We're, we have faith, but not freedom. And we have compassion, but we're not conquerors and we're not more than conquerors. And I'm going to try to, to make this make sense because understanding and applying this truth, it will completely change your life once you grasp this. Justification is the initial act of being declared righteous before God. One man said, it's when God changes me and it's justified, never done all the sins that I've done before because now I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. It's justification. It's, if you will, it's the Acts 238 experience. It's repentance. It's baptism in Jesus' name. And it's the infilling of the Holy Ghost when God takes control of my life. And I want you to understand this justification is 100% free. There is nothing you can do to earn that. When God steps into your life and he takes your old dirty garments of sin and places his robe of righteousness upon you, you didn't do anything to get that. You couldn't be good enough to earn it. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you can never be good enough to be justified. You, you, you are saved, the scripture says, by grace through faith in Jesus. And as Christians, we're good at justification. Because justification is free. And us Pentecostals, we love free. Don't we? Who doesn't love free? Sanctification is a different monster. Sanctification is the ongoing process of becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification means growing in holiness and in obedience. And a huge part of sanctification is the Holy Ghost working in my life, as the scripture says, to guide me toward all truth. And as a Christian, I have to understand the difference because Paul was reminding the early church, you went through justification, which required no effort on your part, no commitment at all. All you had to do was show up, repent, be baptized, and receive a free gift. You did it. It was accomplished through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But now I'm telling you, work out the salvation. Now you need to commit to the process of becoming more like Jesus in your everyday life, not just on Sunday. In other words, justification is free, but sanctification requires some effort. It requires some intentionality. And why am I spending time here? Because some of us are stuck in this misunderstanding and it's killing us. And I'm going to tell you how it's used against us. The enemy continually throws guilt and shame in your face because he wants you to feel unworthy. Because if you never understand your worth and your value to the kingdom, you will never do anything for the kingdom. And so continually you are, you are in this cycle of, I'm not good enough. I could never be anointed enough. I could never do enough. God could never use me. I could never be. And you fill in the blank. 
This attack comes over and over and over again. And what it does is it creates this continuous cycle or this loop in your life where you cycle back through the process of justification over and over and over again. Because in that moment that I'm justified, I feel clean and I feel good. And then the next day when the enemy comes and I feel that guilt come in, I cycle back again and I need to be justified again over and over. I'm coming back to the altar and don't get me wrong. We should pray through every day. That's what Paul said. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But mentally, we're going back to justification over and over again. And Paul recognized this. And he warned the early believers, many of you are unstable because you're justified but you're not becoming sanctified. Watch what he said. You've been made new, but you're not making anything new. You're stuck in the rut of your initial experience. You're resting in the safety of your newfound status, but you're not growing. You're not maturing. You're not developing. You're stuck on drinking milk when God's trying to bring you to the meat. And you can't walk in true spiritual freedom. If you're going to stay with the bottle and the babies. At some point, if you really want to be more than a conqueror, you've got to step away from the bottle, put the pacifier behind. And you've got to step into what the scripture says, the maturation. This moment that I begin to be transformed from what I was to who God's calling me to be. And Paul recognized this and he said, you're stagnant because you're living in a cycle of grace without growth. And true grace will always produce. Where grace is present, there will be something produced. The seed will come to fruition. Paul was warning that church that you have unlimited potential, but you're making little progress. You walk in the unfulfillment of broken dreams. Not because your God doesn't want to do great things, but because of today's idleness. And I'm just going to tell you, I know it's not popular to current church theology. I'm not even going to say forgive me because it is what it is. The early church wasn't afraid to stand up in front of people and say, where are your works? Where are your works? And they didn't get it wrong either. Because Jesus, who they based all of this off of, did the same thing. He, he taught things like this. You want to know who the true believers are? Look at the signs that follow them. In one other place, he said, you'll know them by their fruit. What's he saying? He's saying, look at the works. If you want to tell the real from the fake, look at the works. And the scary thing is that while modern religious world attempts to minimize works, the early church taught this, that a church without works isn't even a church. The early church taught that a Christian without works isn't really a Christian at all. And someone that I shared this with said, yeah, but aren't we supposed to be content with what we have? We don't need to be working that much, do we? Is works really that important? And I, I let it slide, but I, I felt this Righteous indignation rise up in my spirit, maybe because I've been through this for the past few weeks in my, in my own life. But I felt the spirit well up within me and I felt God kind of speak to my spirit. Contentment is powerful. It's a biblical concept. But too often, Jonathan, you, entertain, you, you interchange contentment and complacency. You're called to be content, but you're not called to be complacent. I still expect you to be growing I still expect you to be maturing. I still expect you to prioritize my kingdom. I still expect you to put me first. I still expect you to grow in a relationship with me. I still expect you to follow my voice. I still, still expect you to impact your world. I still expect you to be part of a last day movement. I still expect you to do great things. I gave you a dream, Jonathan, because I want people to see me through you. And if people look at you and they don't see me, you're not doing what I called you to do. And I'm going to end on a high note because I know that was heavy. I'm going to end on a high note. 
musicians, you can come. And everybody says, thank God. Truth number four, your path has prepared you. Your path has prepared you. As a minister and as someone who's been through it myself, I'm just going to tell you, I'm sick and tired of God trying to work but not being able to because I don't feel good enough. I don't feel like I can. I don't feel anointed. And I'm just going to tell you, your path has prepared you. As I was looking over Joseph, the life of Joseph through this concept, it starts off as a 17-year-old kid who ends up in Potiphar's house. And we kind of glossed over the scripture because it happened so fast. But you've got to understand in those couple of verses talking about Potiphar's house, it was a little bit of time that went by. So what that means is there's this process where Joseph comes in as this raw kid. But because he has an excellent attitude and he refuses to give up on God, he refuses to quit. He is who he is. He's a believer in God. Through the process of time. And an excellent attitude, he begins to take on responsibilities in Potiphar's house until finally Potiphar comes. And Potiphar says, you know, you do more than anybody else. I've noticed when you take charge, things happen. There's something different about you. And over time, Joseph learns to be overseer of a palace until he's lied on and then thrown in prison. And then we gloss over that verse that talks about him, but he's elevated even in the prison. But this is years that he's in this prison. But through an excellent attitude and a refusal to quit, he starts learning things about prison life. And he keeps trusting God. And one day the warden notices this guy just... Every time he does something, it works. So he comes to Joseph and I don't know what it is, but there's something different about you and I want to place you over this prison. And now Joseph has learned how to be over a palace and over a prison. Your path is preparing you because one day Joseph stands in front of Pharaoh and the Bible says God gave him the interpretation of the dream but you study the dream and there's nothing in the dream about anything else there's no plans that God says now tell him this now do this now do that but Joseph has learned how to oversee a palace and he's learned how to oversee a prison and he stands before Pharaoh and is not ashamed to say, I've overseen a prison and I've overseen a palace. Now I'm ready to oversee an empire. If you'll just put me in charge, the same God that brought me through those things will bring us through this famine. I want to tell you as we all stand, Every problem in your past, every pain in your past has been preparing you for this pivotal moment. And while you sit there and you say, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I could never. You've got a God who says, don't you remember the prison? Don't you remember the palace? It seemed like a problem in those things, in those times, but it was the prison and the palace that empowered you to rule the empire. Every problem you've had, you didn't know it, but I've been working behind the scenes to, to create something in your life that in this moment, you would be ready if you'll work it. If you'll work it while you're awake. There's this idea, and I'm closing, but there's this idea we have that, well, I'm just going to wait till the anointing comes. I'm just going to wait till God moves. I'm just going to wait till God lets me know for sure. I'm just going to wait till the Spirit comes in. And we miss it because we, we get it backwards. Scripture says this in Proverbs 16 and 3. The King James Version says, Commit thy thoughts unto the Lord. And your thoughts 
shall be established. The NLT kind of clarifies that. It says, commit your actions to the Lord. And then your plans will succeed. Work it. I've got two words for you as I close. Work it. You have a dream. Work it. You have something you know that God's wanting you to do. The time of waiting for the anointing to come and waiting for God to speak and waiting. I'm telling you, God is saying in the spirit, work it. You want to be more than a conqueror? Work it. You've got an enemy you need to face? Work it. You've got a mountain you need to climb? Work it. Let's all come together right now. I'm making you this promise this morning as we're coming. I'm making you this promise not because it's from me, because I believe this firmly in the Word of God and what God has been speaking to me about. If you will work it, God's going to show up. If you will begin to work those things in your life that you're afraid of, God will begin to move. God's going to honor your action. He's going to honor your work. Lift your hands. I want to pray for you right now. Father, in your name, I pray right now that every broken dream, every abandoned dream, God, every dream that we're afraid to embrace, I pray that you would awaken it within us if it is from you, Jesus, and give us a desire and a heartbeat and a passion to work it, God. Let the anointing of your spirit move. I pray for every person in this place, God, right now that needs your spirit, that, that needs direction, God, that needs healing right now, Lord. Let the spirit move. I pray that your power would shake us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's lift him up. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon. 